In this video, we are going to cover organisms from the genera Mycoplasma and Ureaplasma. Organisms within these um, genera are atypical bacteria. Um, remember that atypical bacteria don't follow the normal structure or replication pattern that we associate with most bacterial organisms. What makes these guys in particular special is that they have no cell wall. Um, and that's really, really important when you think about it from a treatment standpoint, an identification standpoint. So it's very unique to these particular organisms. So the other thing that's unique about these guys is that they are the, the smallest free living bacteria in the world. They're able to pass through most filtration systems used to remove bacteria. And they were initially confused with viruses as a result of this, because remember, viruses are characterized as filterable agents. And while well, these are filterable, um, they're only about 0.1 to 0.2 micrometers in diameter. And most bacteria are anywhere from 0.5 to 1 micrometer wide. So these are really, really small. Um, the other unique thing, as I mentioned about these two, is that they don't have a cell wall. Um, they do have a cell membrane, and there are cell mem and their cell membrane contains sterols, um, which is also a little different. So this means something really important from a treatment standpoint. Without a cell wall, you cannot treat them with cell wall inhibitors. They won't even care. That means you know no penicillin, no vancomycin, no cell uh, cephalosporins. They don't notice it because they don't have a cell wall. So there's no penicillin binding proteins to make those work. So identifying them will actually really inform how you might treat a patient that is infected with one of these. Um, they can vary in shape anywhere from um, a cocci shape to a rod shape. Um, but not that that's really going to help you, because remember, they have no cell wall. So if they have no cell wall, we can't really use gram stain like we do for other organisms, because gram stain really only shows you the presence or um, lack thereof of a thick peptidoglycan. Well, these guys don't have peptidoglycan because they don't have cell wall. So you're not going to be using gram stain on these guys. Um, there are four organisms we're going to talk about. We're going to cover three right now. Uh, U. urolyticum, M. genitalium, and M. hominis. Um, what's interesting about these guys is that they're all facultative anaerobes. Um, that actually differentiates it from the fourth org organism that we'll talk about in a minute, M. pneumoniae, because um, M. pneumoniae is actually a strict aerobe. So the fact that these guys can facultatively perform anaerobic respiration is interesting. Um, the only thing that's a little bit also interesting about these guys is that they're really, really s slow growers. They grow very, very slowly, which also makes diagnosis difficult, right? So they have no cell walls, so we can't gram stain them. And they grow really slowly, so culture is not really all that beneficial. Um, so with these three organisms, U. urolyticum, M. genitalium, and M. hominis, we're generally thinking about um, genitourinary tract infections, so GU infections. The genitourinary tract is colonized with both mycoplasma and ureaplasma, um, meaning that many women anyway are asymptomatic carriers. So just because you identify these organisms in a patient sample doesn't mean they're necessarily causing disease. And so it's sometimes difficult to understand the role they play in disease. However, it is generally accepted that these three organisms can cause non-gonococcal urethritis, um, which is basically a really fancy way of saying infection of the urethra that is not caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. Um, they also have a role in pelvic inflammatory disease, pyelonephritis. Um, pyelonephritis is basically just inflammation of the kidney. And inflammation of your kidneys can be really, really painful. Um, and it leads to permanent kidney damage or scarring of the kidney. So it's a pretty nasty complication. The other thing this has occasionally been linked to is miscarriage, um, spontaneous abortion, or premature birth. So if the uh, patient happens to be pregnant, there can be some severe consequences for the fetus as well if mom is infected with any of these three organisms. Probably the most important organism that we'll talk about in this video is mycoplasma pneumoniae. Um, this is actually a strict human extracellular pathogen, so it does not go intracellular, 
like Listeria or Rickettsia or any of the other um, atypical bacteria that we've talked about that are able to force phagocytose. And the reason it's a strict extracellular pathogen is because, like I said, it's an obligate aerobe, so it requires oxygen. If it goes inside the cell, oxygen could become limiting, and that can be dangerous to the organism itself. So it stays outside. Um, it's spread through aerosols, um, and it can be a normal flora. So occasionally you'll have asymptomatic carriage of M. pneumo, where it's, you know, uh, it's not causing disease, it's just colonizing. Um, but when it does cause disease, the most common clinical presentation of M. pneumoniae is tracheobronchitis. Um, it's associated with kind of uh, low-grade fever, malaise, headache, and kind of a dry, non-productive cough. <coughs> and this cough is associated with the atypical pneumonia that we um, associate with this. It's the primary cause of atypical pneumonia. So what do I mean by atypical pneumonia? Um, atypical pneumonia is sometimes referred to as walking pneumonia. So typical pneumonia is much more severe. With typical pneumonia, patients will say things like, I was so sick, I couldn't even go to the doctor. Um, the fatigue is in extreme. The fevers are high. Um, the, uh, you can have some hemoptysis. Um, that means coughing up blood. Uh, the cough is typically more productive. Um, it's a much more significant, severe disease course. You're either flat on your back in bed, in the waiting room waiting to see the doctor so that he can send you to bed, or you're in the hospital. Um, you don't go to work and school and out with friends with typical pneumonia because you just, you can't. You're just too exhausted, too sick. Atypical pneumonia is different. It's still pneumonia, like you still have fluid in the lungs as a result of inflammatory buildup, you still have the pathogen in your lungs, but you can fight your way through it a bit. Um, you're well enough to go to work, you're well enough to go to school and get everybody there sick because you're constantly coughing. The cough isn't productive, it's kind of hacking and annoying to people that you might be sitting in a classroom with. Um, you guys won't have to worry about that too much as you're doing the majority of your studying outside of class. Um, but it used to be something that you would think about as you heard people hacking their way through lectures, or at least I did in grad school. Um, so the other thing with mycoplasma pneumonia is that the fevers are going to come and go. You'll have, you know, kind of higher spikes, but they'll, they'll spike and then they'll go away and then they'll spike and they'll go away. And um, that'll likely be controlled somewhat by over-the-counter medication. With typical pneumonia, the fevers are pretty consistent. So that's another differentiating factor. Um, and like I said, you have that dry, non-productive cough. Um, diagnosis is mainly made by symptoms, right? Because the mycoplasma are slow growers. So you're not gonna really be able to find it. Although you would have the time to find it and diagnose it with this one because it has a pretty long incubation and it also has a pretty long course. Um, takes two to three weeks for disease onset, and then it can persist for, you know, two weeks or longer, um, just kind of depending on how quickly the patient gets over their symptoms. Um, so one way you can diagnose it is by symptoms. Another thing is that the chest x-ray will be kind of patchy, um, maybe some lower lobe consolidation, but for the most part, it's a patchy infiltration on the chest x-ray. The other thing that's somewhat diagnostic, um, it lacks specificity, but people use it, is cold agglutinins. So basically you have an, you've produced antibodies um, when you have mycoplasma that are somewhat cross-reactive for blood groups, only um, mildly. So when red blood cells from the patient are cooled, the blood will agglutinate, um, and this cold agglutinins test is positive in about 60% of patients that have M pneumoniae. So if you see a stem that says positive cold agglutinins, it pretty much is M pneumo. That's what they're talking about. Um, it's not specific necessarily, but that's what they're trying to get at.